Bueno, molt bona tarda. Us donem la benvinguda a l'Aula Europa, a la seu de les institucions europees a Barcelona, per aquesta conferència debat sobre l'Europa social. I primerament vull agrair al Centre d'Estudis de Temes Contemporanis per haver volgut organitzar aquí aquest primer acte d'un cicle de debat sobre el futur d'Europa. En quant al seu director, el Pere Almeda, ens va contactar per veure si seria possible organitzar aquí aquesta xerrada, doncs ràpidament vam acceptar, vam convenir que era una molt bona idea i... I, bé, de fet, és que crec que és imprescindible que l'administració a tots els nivells faci seva la Unió Europea i que hi hagi una forta cooperació interinstitucional. I ja que comptem amb la presència de diputats del Parlament de Catalunya, vull comentar que, de fet, el 28 de gener vam fer una compareixença davant de la Comissió d'Afers Exteriors al Parlament de Catalunya per parlar de les eleccions europees amb el portaveu del Parlament Europeu. És una d'aquestes iniciatives que s'han d'enfortir i s'ha de créixer així. Però si hi ha un tema que especialment és important i que hauria de ser central a la propera legislatura del Parlament Europeu, aquesta sens dubte seria l'Europa Social. El maig de l'any passat a l'oficina del Parlament Europeu a Barcelona vam organitzar amb la taula d'entitats del tercer sector a Catalunya, aquí mateix una jornada sobre el pilar social europeu, sis mesos després de la cimera de Gothenburg, que és on es van proclamar els 20 drets i principis del pilar social. Aquesta jornada va ser una jornada de diàleg amb les entitats socials catalanes i amb la ponent al Parlament Europeu sobre el pilar social, l'eurodiputada portuguesa Maria Joa Rodríguez, i que es va estructurar en tres eixos, la igualtat d'oportunitats, condicions laborals justes i protecció social i inclusió. Aquest diàleg amb entitats socials, que va ser pioner aquí a Catalunya, s'ha reeditat a altres oficines d'informació del Parlament Europeu, també amb la ponent Maria Joa Rodríguez, en vistes de la bona acollida que va tenir aquí. I parlant del pilar social europeu, el passat 7 de febrer la Unió Europea va arribar a un acord sobre la directiva sobre condicions laborals de la Unió Europea que està enfocada en formes de treball atípiques associades amb la nova economia. És a dir, l'objectiu d'aquesta nova directiva, d'aquesta nova regulació, és assegurar una major transparència en aquestes modalitats de treball associades a plataformes com Uber, Deliveroo, o empleats de la llar o empleats temporals. Aquesta directiva forma part del pilar social europeu i d'aprovar-se seria la primera legislació normativa laboral europea en 18 anys. Ara està previst que el text es voti en sessió plenària al darrer ple d'aquesta legislatura, el 16 d'abril a Estrasburg. Finalitzo aquí felicitant l'elecció del professor Van Peris per la conferència i agraint molt als eurodiputats Ramon Tremosa i Jordi Soler per la seva participació al debat. Moltes gràcies per la seva assistència i passo la paraula al director del Centre d'Estudis de Temes Contemporanis, el senyor Pere Almeda. Moltes gràcies, Sergi. Moltes gràcies a tothom per haver vingut aquesta tarda a l'Aula Europa, a la seu de l'Oficina del Parlament i la Comissió Europea a Barcelona. Soc Pere Almeda, el... Ups. Perdó. El director del Centre d'Estudis de Temes Contemporanis de la Generalitat, del Departament d'Acció Exterior. Per aquells que no coneixeu el centre, és un espai, un centre de reflexió, un think tank in-house, del Govern de la Generalitat per reflexionar sobre els grans temes contemporanis, els grans temes globals i informar i proposar en el Govern anàlisi i proposta sobre aquests temes perquè actui, posi en marxa polítiques i també informi la ciutadania. L'acte d'avui és el primer dels actes d'un cicle que iniciem des del centre, centrat en el futur del projecte europeu. Aquest semestre és un semestre decisiu per Europa. Europa viu un moment d'inflexió i des del centre dedicarem tota una sèrie d'activitats i un monogràfic de la revista Idees centrat en diferents perspectives del tema europeu. Comencem avui, doncs, aquest cicle amb l'acte sobre l'Europa social i hem convidat el professor Van Paris i després farem un debat posterior amb els eurodiputats Ramon Tremosa i Jordi Soler, que moderarà la directora general d'Acció Exterior, la Mireia Borrell, i vull agrair a tots ells que hagin pogut venir a participar en aquest acte. Aquest, com us deia, és el primer dels actes. El proper 27 de març farem el segon, centrat en la democràcia a Europa, Farem un diàleg també amb el professor Daniel Inerarity i el professor de la Pompeu Fabra, Josep Lluís Martí. I el mes de maig organitzarem també un altre debat 
amb l'historiador i escriptor alemany Philip Blom i la filòsofa Marina Garcés sobre els valors i la història europea molt centrats en no repetir els errors dels anys 30 que cada vegada i de manera més sinistra sembla que tenim similituds amb el moment actual. Let me say thank you again, Professor Van Paris, to participate in this event. We are extremely honored to have you today in Barcelona, and we know you have made some efforts to join us today on this date. As you all may know, Professor Van Paris is a political philosopher and political economist. He's professor of on the Faculty of Economic, Social and Political Science at the University of Louvain and where he directs the Hoover Chair of Economic and Social Ethics since its creation in 1991. He has been a visiting professor in many universities, such as Harvard and Yale University, or senior research fellow at Nuffield College in Oxford and many, many other universities. He has published many books based on his work, and I want to highlight one particular, Real Freedom for All, uh, What, If Anything, Can Justify Capitalism, and his remarkable and well-recognized work on basic income, where he has established the conceptual arguments both of justice and feasibility of a basic income for every citizen. He has also developed a very interesting research and proposals on linguistic justice, which has been followed uh, very closer here in Catalonia. One last thing uh, that I want to emphasize, he, uh, he has coordinated a recent book about multi-level nationalism, the Catalan question and its lessons for Europe and Belgium. However, I want to say that when we invited Professor Van Varish to Barcelona, beyond all his work, I was very interested to listen his views on how can we move forward to a more social Europe, and his interesting approach and views and critical views on how the European Union has become a neoliberal paradigm of a super national federation dreamed by Hayek, and how to explain the free market. So the question that we want to discuss today and that we have asked Van Paris to develop is how we move forward to a social Europe and we are very eager to listen your views on it. So the floor is yours, Mr. Paris. Thank you very much. My apologies for not uh, speaking in Catalan. In fact, I realize it is not very difficult to understand Catalan, which is uh, sort of halfway between uh, Spanish and French, right? Just as English is about uh, halfway between uh, uh, German and French or Dutch and French. So uh, that makes it easier to understand it, but not easier to speak it. So I'll play safe and uh, speak English to you also for a more fundamental reason uh, to which I will come uh, later on. Um, yes, uh, the opportunity or the motive for inviting me had something to do with Hayek. Hayek, as uh, many of you know, is an Austrian-born uh, um, uh, economist, uh, more than an economist, uh, who then spent most of his life uh, first in the United Kingdom, then uh, in the United States, and he is not exactly a friend for most of us, uh, even less a friend of uh, the welfare state, of social policy, uh, or of social Europe, which is uh, the theme of today's uh, conference. But he was an incredibly insightful guy who got the Nobel Prize in economics despite the fact that he was rejecting uh, orthodox uh, neoclassical e economics um, and because no doubt uh, and legitimately he got legitimately in my eyes because he was practicing a sort of thinking that was sort of resolutely transdisciplinary uh, crossing the borders between economics philosophy political science sociology and that is the sort of thinking we need including to understand the deep uh, problems of uh, today's world. And I'll, therefore, I shall begin and I shall end uh, with Hayek. I begin with a very old article 
which I can warmly recommend to all of you. Published 80 years ago, 1939, under the title The Economic Conditions of Interstate Federalism. It is a sort of fervent plea for something which resembles very much, arguably, uh, what the European Union has become today. Hayek is enthusiastic about it because it combines, well, still a sort of sheer dream at the time, but it, because it combines two features. Feature number one, there is a single market, there is free movement of capital, services, goods, people. As a result of that, there is, of course, strong fiscal and social competition between the member states of this federation. Because of this competition, what these member states were doing or trying to do before, which is interfere with the market in order to redistribute from the rich to the poor, in order to regulate uh, child labor, uh, whatever, uh, environmental issues, all this is made far more difficult, if not impossible, because of the competition between the various member states. So first feature, economic unsustainability of a social state in particular, welfare state, at the level of each of the components of this federation, of each of the member states. Second feature, related to the question you may immediately ask, yes, but what can no longer be done at the level of each member states can then be done at the level of the union as a whole, okay, more efficiently. No, no, that will not happen, says Hayek, for two reasons. One, the, if you have this federation, if it's a European federation of some size, it will be very heterogeneous, objectively. And therefore, what is good for one component of the Union will be bad for another. For example, just to think about recent issues, some people especially the representatives of the workers in the richer countries, the more productive countries, will say we want a minimum wage that will apply to the whole of the Union in order to prevent social dumping, this sort of uh, competition through lower wages coming from other countries. Let's leave the, uh, leave the, the, the minimum wage all over, introduce a minimum wage across the Union. And of course, immediately, people in the less productive uh, countries will say, you are trying to kill us, right? Because if we have a minimum wage at the same level as uh, uh, in your places, we'll go completely out of business here. And uh, it will be a way of, of killing our economy. All we'll be able to do is uh, close our, our, our factories because uh, we don't have a level of productivity that would, uh, could sustain these higher wages. That's the first reason why it won't happen at the level of the union if the union is sufficiently heterogeneous. And the second reason, even more important in IXIs, is that at the level of the, union, it, of the Union, it will not be possible to do what was possible at the level of each of the nations, because they lack a strong identity. It's a strong common identity that made it possible to have a French welfare state where uh, the uh, richer French people would agree to redistribute a sizable amount to the poor people in France, nous sommes tous Français, thereby, therefore we do it for la patrie, and that uh, is uh, politically feasible. But he says, um, quote from memory, he says, can you imagine that a clerk in the city of London would agree to pay more for his bicycle in order to help a Belgian worker? Can you imagine that? Rhetorical question for him, the, the answer is obvious, the clerk in the city of London will not accept to do that and therefore forget about having a welfare state at the level of the union as a whole. Of course, all this rings fairly familiar. I mean, you could have a significant amount of uh, solidarity from the Wessies to the Aussies, from the West Germans to the East Germans once you had uni unification. But try to do that from the Germans to the Greeks is a completely different matter, right? This was Hayek, 1939. And he finishes that article by saying, well, what he calls the liberal project, 
what we call today neoliberalism, and the creation of such a multinational federation are two uh, projects, are two um, proposals that go hand in hand, that presuppose each other, that reinforce each other. Okay? This is uh, the point, my Hayekian uh, point uh, of uh, departure. And uh, the question is, um, well, uh, what can be done about it? Uh, also, of course, to some extent, uh, is this really true? I, uh, there was uh, not maybe about six months ago, there was a, uh, an event organized at the European Parliament in Brussels. Uh, European Parliament is very different from the European Commission, even when you enter the buildings there, because you have all sorts of activities of all sorts happening in the Commission. The corridors of the Commission is far more still to try to and it's far more far stiffer. And so there was, a, I got some information about their uh, a meeting organized by some sort of pretty ultra liberal Swedish uh, think tank, but sponsored by a pretty uh, right wing member of the, con the British Conservative Party. And it started with uh, a quote from this article, uh, extensive quotation from this article I just mentioned by the uh, director of that Swedish uh, think tank. But the tone was pretty despondent, uh, that, uh, sounded a bit depressed because they said, look, unfortunately, Hayek's project has not succeeded because one, the welfare states are still surviving in the various uh, member states. And two, the European Union is beginning to make a number, take a number of steps. So they are thinking about pillars, uh, social pillars, and things like that. So the Hayekian project is uh, deeply uh, in uh, trouble. Um, nonetheless, huh? nonetheless, well, you can qualify that in all sorts of ways, and we shouldn't say too quickly that it's impossible to do things at uh, the uh, national level. But it is true, and you constantly hear that in each uh, of our member states, to say, oh, no, sorry, we can't tax uh, the rich, we can't tax uh, corporations, because if we, uh, if we do that, then the juicy taxpayers will move elsewhere, fictitiously or really. We have uh, plenty of uh, French uh, tax exilees uh, living in Brussels uh, at the moment, uh, for, to give just one example. or. Um, <clears throat> Oh, we have uh, Amazon uh, uh, sort of uh, settling just at the border in Holland uh, because there they have a tax deal that's far more favorable than what they would get in Belgium. So constantly you feel under threat and you say, sorry, we can't be more generous for our schools, for our healthcare system, for uh, the uh, guaranteed minimum incomes we have in our country because otherwise the people who contribute to it or the firms who, uh, that contribute to it will go elsewhere. Has there anything, is anything happening at the level of the Union? Of course, pathetically little. The budget of the European Union as a whole is about uh, 1%, most of it absorbed by uh, the agricultural policy. And so this is not uh, exactly uh, what um, will uh, start resembling uh, a European, an EU-wide uh, welfare state. And even the little that exists is resented by a part of the population, at least in some of the countries. Indeed, one of the uh, motivations that played some role in uh, the Brexit debate was this idea that uh, there was a net contribution by the UK, despite the so-called uh, British uh, rebate. And uh, therefore, if they left the European Union, they could devote this money to the British people by funding better the National Health Service. So we can see that uh, um, we shouldn't exaggerate. Uh, uh, we shouldn't say that uh, the, the Hayek's plan has been fully realized, but there is certainly uh, something uh, like that. So um, what should we do in that context? Some people argue, let's go back. Uh, so some of you may know uh, German uh, author called Wolfgang Streeck. There are some followers also among the uh, Lexiteers, the people who were in favor of Brexit from the left, who say the only way of uh, 
getting again uh, some hope for a better social policy, for a better welfare state, consists in uh, breaking up uh, the European Union. I don't believe either in the possibility or the desirability of doing that. I won't argue for that. I'll take it uh, for granted. And so what's left to do huh, is um, essentially uh, do or try to do what Hayek said was uh, impossible uh, to do. Um, and that is not, doesn't mean uh, replacing the na national welfare states by an EU-wide welfare state, but uh, it does mean uh, doing things, creating institutions, strengthening institutions at the level of the European Union that will partly do what the, wealth, the national welfare states used to do and partly help enable or re-enable the welfare states, the national welfare states, to do what they need to do. Is there any uh, public support no, in the European population in favour of going that way? And let me first uh, refer then to a set of new relevant data, very sort of patchy, but that may help us think about the potential of going in that direction. First, one of the most uh, talked about uh, precise proposal of that, source, uh, of that sort is uh, the proposal of an uh, EU-wide unemployment insurance system. There have been different variants being proposed, uh, where partly as a, a buffering mechanism uh, to help uh, stabilize the euro, but also for the sake of social justice and so the, the protection of solidarity, um, thanks to uh, EU-wide uh, uh, EU institutions, it has been proposed to um, support the, and to complement the national level unemployment insurance system through some sort of EU-funded uh, system. One of the uh, advocates of this sort of approach is uh, someone called Frank van den Broeke, who is currently professor at the University of Amsterdam, but uh, started his career as the, uh, quite young as the, the leader, the president of the Flemish Socialist Party, and then became Minister of Social Affairs and indeed chaired the European uh, Council of Ministers of Social Affairs at the time of the introduction of the open method of coordination. So he has now become an academic and published a paper this year, very recently, on risk sharing, under the title Risk Sharing When Unemployment Hits, How Policy Design Influences Support for European Unemployment uh, Insurance. Um, he did pretty sophisticated uh, uh, research where a large number of different schemes were uh, uh, sort of presented to uh, subjects, to respondents from uh, a large number of uh, uh, member states, and these schemes differed in terms in level in terms of the level of generosity. Was it uh, if unemployed, do you get 40 percent, 60 percent, 70 percent of your previous wage? They uh, varied in terms of conditionality. Uh, how? Um, um, how strict uh, are the conditions in terms of uh, having to apply for jobs or accept jobs if available. They also differed in terms of where, who administered them, whether it was administered at, by national public servants or by European public servants, and they differed, which the, is the relevant point here, in terms of uh, uh, features that were uh, presented as follows. In some schemes, it was said that no country can receive more than it puts in. It was strictly insurance without any redistribution between countries. So ex ante, there was no uh, redistribution. There were schemes where a country where it's possible that a country at the end will receive more than what it, it puts in. And then uh, there was also a scheme where it was said in advance, it was structured in such a way that the poor countries would necessarily benefit from it, huh? so irrespective of the fluctuations in their levels of unemployment. And the outcome was that a number of features uh, definitely made a big difference in terms of public support, like national administration or European administration, people trusted more the national administration, uh, also uh, conditionality played an important role, 
uh, for the popularity of the measures. But there was practically no difference, no statistically significant difference, whether you said that there was going to be redistribution to the, from the richer countries to the poorer countries or not. And this was the case for in richer countries as well as in poorer countries. This is a first little uh, food for thought in terms of what is supported, what is publicly supported. All the other examples I'm going to give are the product of, a, of an interesting collaboration between the European University Institute in Florence and the British uh, polling uh, multinational now called YouGov. And uh, on the occasion of the State of the Union event last year, uh, professors at, uh, different professors at the EUI could uh, introduce some questions that interested uh, them. Uh, for example, uh, were questions introduced by uh, uh, Philip Genschel and Anton Emrek, where the question was, do you think that European countries should be willing to offer financial aid to um, another member state who is suffering from a natural disaster, was the first question. There was a support in favor of it. 78% said, yes, that's a good idea. Hmm? Second one, in case of high, uh, in, in case of a large number of refugees, question was asked uh, to me earlier, 54% in favor said, yes, uh, we are in favor of member states doing that. Uh, in, if the other country is suffering from high unemployment, 44% getting lower, and uh, in case that country suffers from <coughs> an unsustainable level of debt, 37%. Here, there was a strong correlation between uh, the situation of the country. In countries uh, with a low debt or large chance of an un a low chance of, a, of an unsustainable debt, the support for uh, this solidarity was far uh, less. Mm? Unsurprisingly, there was not much of a difference for natural disaster and large number of refugees, but for high unemployment and sustainable debt, there was such a, a significant difference. Then there was also an interesting question, also suggested by them, about the best way to give this financial aid to other member states. Should what pay uh, into an emergency fund in advance to be accessed uh, uh, in the future by uh, countries in crisis, or should one rather pay, um, contribute money on a care on a case by case? Uh, uh, basis. Huh? So do you wait until the crisis happens and then you contribute or should we create a fund for that? There's far more support for, um, for the fund, 36% uh, in favor of that and only 23% uh, in favor of the case by case. Uh, so this was which and these were in, in exclusive options and then there was a, another option, less popular, that uh, said you should reduce potential risks uh, in advance. Then, next, uh, there is um, uh, another question uh, that was uh, uh, asked as uh, follow. Um, do you think that more money should be raised and spent by the EU rather than by the member states? Or do you think the opposite, and that uh, less money should be raised and spent by the EU and more by the member states? There, there were... Uh, the, people who said no more should be spent by the EU. That was particularly popular in Greece, 36% were in favor of that, least popular in Denmark, only 7%. Spain was in between, 26%. More, should more be spent by the member states uh, and less by the EU? Denmark, 35%. Uh, Spain, 20%. At the, that was least, together with uh, Germany. That's third element, food for thought. Fourth, um, it was a more abstract question, but in a way I'm more general. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, you should, one should care only about uh, the interests of people in your own country or equally about the interests of people in all EU countries? People could go from 1 to 10, uh, score from 1 to 10, so i spare you the details. In fact, the modal maximum, so the maximum, the mode was uh, uh, five, at the level five. But among the people who said everyone 
uh, should, uh, for the people who said every, uh, people in all countries should be treated equally, we should care about their interests uh, equally. Uh, there, um, the, uh, in, uh, it was in Sweden that uh, there were less people, least people in favor of that, only 5%. And uh, in that case, uh, Spain was at the top. 22% said, together with Italy and Greece, 22% said we should care equally about the interests of all people in all member states. Huh? As opposed, if you gave only the people who gave 10, a mark of 10, people who gave a mark of 1 said you, we should care only about people in our own uh, country. And finally, uh, and uh, most uh, uh, interestingly, um, <laughs> There is, the, the, that was a question that was uh, put by uh, Miguel Maduro, um, where the question here was, do you support or oppose uh, the idea of the European Union introducing a new tax, um, first on financial transactions? Huh? Should one introduce new tax on financial transactions? Um, Sweden, least, 26%, Greece, 53%, Spain, 40%. If you add uh, that would replace some tax some, that, will, that will reduce accordingly the contributions by your own country to the budget of the EU, then in Spain it goes from 40% to 49%. Tax on financial transactions, that was first. A tax on business profits, Sweden again least, 32%. Germany top, 50%, together with Spain, also 50%, okay? Then uh, a tax on large internet companies, Sweden again, least enthusiastic, 41%, France most enthusiastic, 66%, Spain, 58%, okay? And finally, uh, European tax on carbon emissions, uh, Denmark, again, Scandinavian countries, least enthusiastic, 48%. France, most enthusiastic, 64 Spain, 59%. This indicates, and this is interesting, because when you ask uh, people, would you like the European, uh, the Europe, European Union to spend, to raise and spend more uh, rather than less, only a small minority says, uh, we are in favor of more taxing powers, in fact, to the European Union. But when you ask, would you be in favor of a European tax on uh, financial transactions, a bit less than 50%, uh, it is also without the people, the, the no answers. Uh, so that it's the people who show support or strong support. And, uh, and in the case of uh, carbon taxation, or, uh, or large internet companies, you get a significant majority in favor of it. In, for some of the questions, there is a large uh, proportion of no answers, and that means that there is also room for leadership on this issue. You need to convince people that it's a good idea. So all in all, this, uh, if you, because especially the, the answer to the last question, that's uh, to the initial, well, to, to the middle questions, uh, it indicates at least a way in which the things would need to be phrased in order to uh, get enough uh, public support. Is the support that all this, suggests, uh, all this suggests all we need? Absolutely not. First reason being that we need far more than uh, the, what is suggested in these questions, like an EU-level uh, unemployment insurance, or uh, these various sort of taxation in order to enable uh, the European Union to have uh, more own uh, resources. We need more, yes, uh, we need significantly more, and one of the proposals I've made a number of years ago, and that has been discussed in various places, is the idea of a euro dividend. Euro dividend is a unconditional basic income at the level of about 200 euros per person and per month, that would be funded at European level uh, by VAT. It would be a way of making concrete, tangible to people that the 
uh, huge benefits uh, allegedly made, and in fact really made, by European integration uh, as a result through the various mechanisms that have contributed to the average productivity of the European economy, that these benefits should not be shared uh, or only shared in a very unequal way, depending on your position in uh, the market as a capital owner or as an owner of valuable uh, human capital, but that part of it should be distributed in an equal way uh, through this euro dividend. This euro dividend can be modulated, modulated according to the cost of living in the various countries, but to give an order of magnitude, if you uh, have it at the level of 200 euros, uh, you will uh, need uh, VAT, funded by VAT, you need a VAT of about 19%, which wouldn't be added to the VAT levels in the various countries because it enables all the countries to make various adjustments. That's not a, an increase in the tax burden or at, at that level, but that gives an order of magnitude. And to fund something like that, huh, of course, it won't be enough to uh, rely on a Tobin tax, tax on financial taxation. At most, you could raise something like the equivalent of uh, 10 euros per month under pretty optimistic assumptions about the tax elasticity of the, that uh, tax base. Um, with a carbon tax, you may hope to get to 17 uh, euros per month and uh, per person, again, under pretty optimistic uh, assumptions. So you need, in fact, to have a, a tax that has a much larger uh, tax base, such as VAT, far more plausible as a tax base at European level than personal uh, income tax. Um, why do we need something as radical as that? Well, you need it partly as a macroeconomic stabilizer uh, for the sake of the, uh, the sustainability of the euro, partly as a demographic stabilizer, uh, as a contribution to the political sustainability of Schengen Agreement and the free movement of people, but also as, a country, as, as a, an attempt to deal with Hayek's trap, because this is uh, precisely uh, having a, a, a sort of redistributive system at the level of the Union as a whole, therefore not subjected to intra-European Union tax competition. And of course, at the same time, it, it enables each of the member states to be less subjected to, uh, tax, to, to tax and social competition, because when a firm leaves a particular country, I mean, it still remains partly taxed, or a firm or, or a taxpayer, uh, it, uh, it remains partly taxed to the benefit of the country it has left. And, and if it stays, well, it's already part of it. The taxation serves everyone else uh, elsewhere. Okay, so we need something. We need a number of things that were suggested. We could go in direction of a EU level uh, unemployment benefit uh, system, etc. But it raises all sorts of tricky questions that are avoided uh, with a more radical uh, uh, approach, like um, like a euro dividend. But uh, I think one has to be open-minded, and uh, and uh, several approaches needs uh, to be discussed. But then the question, then and the question with which I'm going to uh, finish, is then how are we going to make this politically? Possible. Uh, so there is some support for some taxation at, uh, at the European level. There is some weakish support for solidarity across uh, borders. How are we going to strengthen that? Obviously, what we need is what uh, we had at the, each of the each of the of the nation states. That is, we need movements that are in this case pan-European. And you start having movements in that direction. So you have uh, parties that are standing for the elections and that claim to be real, not just federations of national parties, but real European parties. And so one of them is uh, the M25, Yanis uh, uh, uh movement. Another one, I don't know whether it's very present in Spain, is called Volt, which is uh, uh, standing in European elections in 18 uh, countries of the European Union. But of course, for all this to uh, have uh, a real uh, uh, strong impact, we need some institutional changes. And one such institutional change for which I, along with a number of other people, have been um, uh, sort of arguing for uh, quite a long time, is having a pan-European electoral district for part of the seats in the European Parliament. 
This had already been discussed at the initiative of Andrew Duff, British MEP at the time by the Constitutional Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, I think over 10 years ago, uh, where it was approved by the committee but uh, rejected by uh, the, uh, the plenary. Now, when, as one was expecting, um, the, the seats, some seats to be vacated as a result of the Brexit, uh, in the European Parliament, uh, a number of people, including Enrico Letta, former Italian Prime Minister, and Emmanuel Macron, but many others, the Spinelli Group in the European Parliament, had been advocating allocating part of the seats to the uh, to such a, on such a, a pan-European constituency, but it um, was rejected by uh, the uh, European Parliament. I think it's essential to keep uh, pushing uh, for that. Now, anyway, now we don't know whether these seats will really be vacated, but uh, I. Uh, happened to be in London when the Brexit, uh, the part of the Brexit discussion was taking place. And you can just enter the House of Commons and go and watch the debate. And there I noticed something which I had, uh, uh, I didn't know before, that is that in the House of Commons you have only four, about 400 seats and you have about 700 members, okay? What happens when, uh, uh, when everyone is there? Some people are standing up. So if Brexit doesn't happen in time, I think the British members of the European Parliament will have to stand up, right? Because some of their seats uh, have been allocated. Wrongly allocated, in my view, they should have been allocated to, uh, the, to, on a, on, on a pan-European constituency. But uh, this is definitely uh, a change that needs to be made. It's, of course, less radical and, in my view, far more suitable to uh, a sort of segmented demos like the European uh, the European one far more suitable than having what is also sometimes supposed a direct election of the president of the commission or the joint president of, of the commission and uh, the council, which in a multi-ethnic, multinational uh, uh, federation like the European Union is more problematic than it seems at first uh, sight. And so I believe that what's far more uh, suitable is uh, to have a pan-European uh, constituency. Equally important, equally important, and that's, I hinted at uh, that at the beginning of uh, what I said today, is the diffusion, uh, the democratization of our lingua franca. Huh? Uh, and that is one of the more fundamental reasons why coming to, whether I come to speak in Catalonia or in Stockholm or in uh, Athens, uh, uh, there is a point in uh, speaking English. English is uh, just a mishmash, as I said before, of uh, French and German. Fre uh, in Belgium, I say of French and Dutch, which is equally true. And, um, and that, but we and some of the Brits said, uh, we want our, our country back. We must say, we want our language back, right? Uh, English is a continental language that was imposed on the Brits in two waves. Uh, first waves was in the 5th century when the Germanic component, component was imposed on the Britons and, uh, and then in the 11th century we had these Normans who had spent one semester on a French course in, in uh, Normandy and then crossed the channel in turn and then added the uh, half of the words and made the syntax more French than the Germanic. And so that's English. So we've been kind enough to lend this language to the Brits uh, for, and indeed to the Americans and many others uh, for uh, some time. Now we need to reappropriate it. But of course, we are going to speak it with a beautiful variety of our accents. Yeah, uh, Catalan, uh, um, Portuguese, whatever, uh, uh, Swedish. Uh, we don't need to try to speak it like Mrs. May or like Mr. Trump. It is our language. We can't care less about Shakespeare. It's not about uh, British uh, culture or about English culture. It's just an instrument and a weapon which we badly need in order to mobilize across borders. So, for example, Yanid Varoufakis was a very bad casting as a finance minister, but is excellent in his present role because we need people who are not Anglophones by birth, but eloquent in English in order to create these pan-European uh, movements. I uh, finish then uh, by uh, saying yes, but uh, given that I've spoken of Brexit, so this is and what I've just been saying is that and we 
uh, need to create the political condition, we need to create this political feasibility of what Hayek said was impossible. And so we need uh, to have a stronger European demos in order than to uh, make these social policies at European level, this social Europe, a stronger social Europe uh, possible. But at the same time, of course, we must keep protecting the economic feasibility of doing that at the level of the European Union. And here is a danger, a danger coming with Brexit. Just listen, uh, listen to this, uh, to what Dominic Raab said, then Brexit Secretary on the 1st of October last year, uh, 2018, at the uh, Conservative Party conference. He said, I'm optimistic history will judge Brexit, not on the torturous haggle with Brussels, but as a springboard to a buccaneering global embrace of free trade. Buccaneers are sort of pirates, and so, and um, of course, what would be bad, deadly for the European project, as I see it, would be this pirate state across the channel that would start competing with the European Union if it has uh, wide access to the European uh, single market. Of course, not only through uh, competitive devaluation of the pound, but also through tax competition through amplifying the massive brain drain that already exists today at the expense of the European Union. There are uh, about 900,000 900, EU nationals, EU 27 nationals, who currently live and most of them work in the United Kingdom, compared to only less than 300,000 British citizens who uh, live in, and a number of them work in EU 27. This is for people between 20, age of 25 and uh, 65. And in fact, the relative majority of the Brits in, the, in EU 27 are in Spain. So this suggests that they are coming here for the sun more than for the work. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, in terms of productive brain drain, it, it's more than half a million of people who are uh, sort of uh, being drained out of the European Union to work in the United Kingdom. A United Kingdom that would be completely free to cherry pick immigrants, to say, uh, we take all the brains, the entrepreneurs, the uh, people with high human capital, and all the riffraff that is for uh, the uh, European Union to deal with. After all, the UK uh, is not on the Mediterranean, so it's not their, their, their problem. Of course, all this would give them a tremendous possibility for uh, doing this sort of competitive uh, fight against uh, whatever the European Union uh, may uh, try uh, to do, uh, so in terms of, uh, of social policy. Um, so that means that in the negotiations about the future relations, as they are called, beyond the withdrawal, it's absolutely essential to protect the European Union against that, and that is what I called in one of my pieces Thatcher's plot. Thatcher was a great admirer of Hayek, and when she, st she was in favor of not only joining the European Economic Community, but in favor of uh, the Single European Act, so the deepening of the single market, in favor of uh, the enlargement to the East, which made the European Union far more heterogeneous. And then when the European Union gave some sign of doing what Hayek said was politically impossible, she said, get out, get out as soon as possible. But if you get out while being in a position to sabotage what is being done in the European Union, this would be the Thatcher way of realizing uh, Hayek's, uh, of keeping us in Hayek's trap, even with uh, the Brits uh, out of it. Let me, I promise that I would finish uh, with uh, Hayek, uh, as I started with Hayek, but now I want to quote uh, from a piece he wrote, not, he published not 80 years ago, but uh, 70 years ago. So 1949, we are then just after the Second World War, and Hayek is despairing. Despairing, why? Because he says socialism, statism, is winning all over. 
you have the New Deal in the United States. You have the East, uh, Eastern Europe that turns uh, Soviet. You have all these um, uh, proposals and, in fact, uh, uh, actual uh, nationalization of uh, railways, mines, uh, banks in, uh, in some cases. Uh, uh, you have the, the development of a huge uh, welfare states in uh, welfare state in many countries is really in uh, desperation. And uh, what what should be done? What if we are to avoid? I quote: "Such a development, we must be able to offer a new liberal program, which appeals to the imagination. We must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure." a deed of courage. What we lack is a liberal utopia. And a bit further, the main lesson which the true liberal must learn from the success of the socialists, what I just described, is that it was their courage to be utopian which gained them the support of the intellectuals and thereby an influence on public opinion which is daily making possible what only recently seemed utterly remote. Those who have concerned themselves exclusively with what seemed practicable in the existing state of opinion have constantly found that even this has rapidly become politically impossible as a result of changes in a public opinion which they have done nothing to guide. And this is my final message. Of course, what I presented as what we need to do is ambitious. In some sense, it is utopian. But we need this utopian because uh, utopia is not only what gives us a direction, it's also what gives us the strength to fight for each of the steps that will take us in that direction. I just published in Belgium a little book about the future of the country under the title Belgium, une utopie pour notre temps. Belgium is in English, both in the French and the Dutch edition, because for the reasons related to what I said earlier. Our lingua franca, also within Belgium, is going to become English. And, um, but for that reason, I was scrapped from the program of, uh, of a conference organized next uh, this coming week by the Francophonie in Brussels, because the, the, it was uh, about the uh, Journée Bruxelloise sur la Francophonie, le multilinguisme. And in the mouth of a number of French people, multilinguisme is just a sort of a camouflage for more French, right? Anyway, so uh, I'm, 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 I believe that uh, English will play that role in the European Union. It also uh, is going to play that role in Belgium. But in my prologue, uh, the prologue of that book was, uh, as a title, l'utopie fait la force. Our motto in Belgium, national motto is l'union fait la force. Uh, but I really believe that we need to have a coherent picture of the future, like Hayek, and in a way that brings together economic thinking, serious economic thinking, but also philosophical thinking, uh, sociological thinking, political thinking. We need to have this picture of the future and then fight for it. This is my message to you. Thank you very much, Philippe. With this idea of the fight for utopia, we'll move on to the debate, and I will give the floor to Mireya Borrell. Thank you. Okay, thanks um, everyone. Um, and thanks Professor Van Parish for the lecture. Primero, haré una pequeña introducción de los de los eurodiputados. Estoy seguro que no cal. Ya los conocéis, ¿eh? Sí. Seguro. Sí. Bueno, es a. Um, Ramon Tremosa um, es uh, doctor en Economía, ha fet de profesor titular al Departamento de Teoría Económica a la Universidad de Barcelona y desde el 2009 es eurodiputado independiente para el Partido Demócrata de Cataluña. También ha estat autor de más de 10 libros sobre Economía, Cataluña y Unión Europea. El último libro es La Europa que han fet fracasar, que ha coautorado a Aleix Sarri. 
Jordi Soler és diputat al Parlament Europeu dels grups verds ALE, és llicenciat en Ciència Política i té un màster d'Estudis Europeus per la Universitat Europea de Vidriana, a Frankfurt Oda. Milita Esquerra Republicana, va ser diputat al Parlament de Catalunya, president de la Comissió d'Afers Exteriors Unió Europea i Cooperació al Desenvolupament del Parlament de Catalunya, va ser també secretari d'Afers Exteriors i de la Unió Europea de la Generalitat, des del 2007 és alcalde de Caldes de Montbui i des del 2017, com he dit, diputat al Parlament Europeu del grup Verds Ale. Començarem amb una pregunta més aviat pels eurodiputats i seguint amb la lecture que ens ha fet el professor Van Parish, que seria... S'ha dit o s'ha comentat que el projecte europeu s'assembla més a un projecte neoliberal. Estaríeu d'acord amb aquesta afirmació? Qui vulgueu. Bé, bona tarda, moltes gràcies. Ha estat un plaer escoltar aquesta conferència. No imaginava pas que parléssim tant de Hayek. Jo, quan era professor amb Juntament a la Fundació Catalunya Oberta, vam impulsar la traducció al català de Camí de Servitud, que és una obra mestra de Hayek, i també vam traduir al català l'acció humana de Font Misses, que és potser el mestre de Hayek, i que té una autobiografia que és un dels deu llibres que jo m'emportaria a una illa deserta. Per tant, per la vostra informació, si teniu temps i ganes, ha sigut molt estimulant. A veure, no hem tingut mai tant tanta intervenció pública en l'economia com avui. No hem tingut mai tanta regulació pública en l'economia com avui. És a dir, d'una banda hi ha un discurs que el neoliberalisme salvatge s'imposa de manera creixent i no diré que hi ha potents forces globalitzadores que empenyen cap aquí, però de l'altra els estats avui són màquines de recaptar big data de recaptar impostos com mai no s'havia imaginat, de control de l'activitat econòmica com mai no s'havia imaginat i per tant per mi és discutible aquesta afirmació que vivim un intent de viure en una societat, diguem-ne, no, és a dir, com Hayek reconeix fa 70 anys, l'estat del benestar, el sector públic ha crescut d'una manera molt gran i avui en dia determina el progrés econòmic i pot reconduir grans quantitats de diners d'un lloc a un altre. Hi ha grans estats que transfereixen massives quantitats de diners, Espanya, Itàlia, França, Alemanya no tant. Per tant, els estats per mi són molt importants. I la Unió Europea pateix d'un mal, que és que els estats no li volen cedir poder. Els estats, les grans capitals, la Unió Europea planteja aquest repte d'una Europa federal, i acabo amb un exemple, perquè suposo que són respostes curtes. Fixeu-vos, tenim aquest... Fa dues setmanes la comissària de competència, Margaret Festager, ha vetat no la fusió o la integració entre Alstom i Siemens, però sí la proposta concreta que havien fet les dues empreses, perquè va contra la llei europea. Quina ha sigut la resposta del govern europeista de Macron i de Bruno Le Maire, voldríem repatriar a París les competències de la Direcció General de Competència sobre fusions frontereres. Per tant, les capitals tenen un gran poder i no el volen cedir a nivell europeu. I la poca Europa que tenim és qüestionada fins i tot per un govern europeista com el de Macron. Per tant, els poders estatals són molt forts i la Unió Europea té un problema no es pot fer més forta perquè les grans capitals no deixen que creixi. Bé, bon vespre a tothom i gràcies al Centre d'Estudis de Temes Contemporanis per haver-me convidat a participar en aquesta interessant sessió i a la la seu de la Comissió Europea i del Parlament Europeu per donar-nos, per cedir-nos aquest espai. Bé, a la pregunta sobre si la Unió Europea és el triomf d'aquest model neoliberal o no, jo diria que la Unió Europea actual no és la utopia liberal que s'havia imaginat o per la qual havia advocat 
en Hayek, però diria que té un component clar neoliberal si mirem quines són les preferències de la Unió Europea, en el sentit que em sembla difícilment discutible que la Unió Europea és sobretot un projecte basat en el mercat comú, en l'euro, en les quatre llibertats fonamentals i a mi em sembla que això sí que té una clara correspondència amb l'agenda neoliberal. Ara, evidentment, no vol dir que la Unió Europea només sigui això. Hi ha altres coses. Tot i això, també crec que hem de diferenciar si parlem de la Unió Europea estrictament com a institucions d'aquest artefacte supraestatal que és la Unió Europea o parlem de la Unió Europea com a suma d'estats més institucions europees. Si parlem de la Unió Europea en aquesta segona versió, veurem que la mobilització de recursos públics de mitjana a Europa és aproximadament del 50% del PIB, que per tant hi ha una intervenció pública clara pel que fa als recursos econòmics, però si mirem, és a dir, si traiem la Unió Europea i traiem els 27 estats membres, veurem que el pressupost europeu només mobilitza un 1% del PIB dels 28, aviat 27 segurament, aviat 27 estats membres, que el pressupost europeu és un pressupost que és molt, 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 molt poc redistributiu, que es basa en complementar polítiques dels estats membres, la majoria, no totes, hi ha intervenció directa, però és poca, i per tant, en aquest sentit, jo també diria, en el sentit institucional, minimalista, crec que també hi ha una correspondència entre el projecte neoliberal i la realitat de la Unió Europea. If you want to add something, feel free, it's all right? Okay, thank you. Durant la lecture, i també el Ramon Tremosara ha parlat, s'ha parlat d'una Europa federal, d'una Europa social, és a dir, jo crec que són, suposo, dos conceptes que van junts, però no necessàriament és el mateix. Llavors, quan parlem d'Europa federal o d'Europa social, exactament què volem dir? Són potser dos conceptes, poden anar... Poden ser una mica contradictoris, és a dir, potser es pot portar l'estat del benestar a un nivell federal, però això vol dir que hi ha alguns països, com per exemple els nòrdics, que potser perdrien alguns drets socials. Per tant, a què ens referim quan ens referim a l'Europa social? A veure, si hi ha una causa utòpica avui és l'Europa federal i l'Europa social, entesa com a traslladar a nivell europeu esquemes que tenim de protecció social dintre dels estats membres. Per mi és una causa la més utòpica que hi ha avui en dia. No hi ha a Europa cap país on una majoria de votants i de partits vulguin més sessió de poder a Europa. Al contrari. Europa és un èxit econòmic perquè la integració europea és el que imita tot el món d'Europa, les àrees de lliure circulació, de persones, de serveis, de capitals de mercaderies en diferents graus i nivells, però és un fracàs polític. El Brexit és el fracàs d'aquesta legislatura, l'increment dels partits eurosèptics i o eurofòbics és també un fracàs. Algunes coses s'han fet molt malament durant molt de temps per part dels grans partits que han pilotat i liderat la construcció del projecte europeu. Per tant, èxit econòmic, fracàs polític. A més a més, ara veiem, jo he estat involucrat a la Comissió d'Economia en la Unió Bancària, la Unió Bancària no completa la taulada, la tercera pota, el Fons de Garantia Europeu de Dipòsits, perquè els nòrdics diuen no solidarity without responsibility. És a dir, no parlarem de més Europa fins que no quadreu el pressupost, fins que no reduïu riscos. I això no està passant, és a dir, Alemanya, per exemple, ha reduït el seu deute públic en els últims anys del 80% del PIB al 60% del PIB. I ho ha fet pujant les pensions un 4,5% anual, quan la inflació a Alemanya ha sigut del 1% anual. Les pensions a Alemanya guanyen poder adquisitiu de 3 punts en termes reals cada any. I, en canvi, en els països del sud d'Europa, l'estat del benestar 
està qüestionat per la ineficiència del sector públic espanyol. Espanya ha gastat en 20 anys gairebé 100.000 milions d'euros en trens d'alta velocitat que mai no seran rendibles ni amortitzables. Això té un cost d'oportunitat brutal en termes d'estat del benestar o d'ús alternatiu del diner públic. Per tant, des d'aquest punt de vista, hi ha una... Els alemanys redueixen deute públic per ser independents fiscalment i no dependre dels americans i dels rescats de l'FMI. T'ho diu Martin Schulz, això, eh? No és Ramon Tremosa que s'ha embriagat de Hayek i que ara està on fire. No, 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 això t'ho diu Martin Schulz, hem de ser independents dels americans i per això hem de reduir el deute públic, ho deia ell, diverses vegades, no? I, en canvi, els països del sud d'Europa, França, Macron ha fracassat en la seva política de contenció del dèficit i tornarà a estar superant el 3% del límit. I si mireu el que ha dit la premsa alemanya de quan Macron cedeix a les armilles grogues, és el final d'un altre president nacionalista francès que quan parla de més Europa pensa en més França. I això la premsa alemanya n'és plena. Per tant, Europa social entesa com a tal la veig molt lluny i l'Europa federal també, no? Bé, jo crec que d'alguna manera la Unió Europea ja és un sistema federal o federalitzant, no?, que podrien dir alguns teòrics de la política. El problema és que aquesta realitat federal té un parell de constrenyiments, per mi, molt importants, no?, que d'alguna manera dificulten el funcionament federal d'aquesta realitat. El primer és que el nivell superior d'aquest sistema federal, és a dir, per entendre'ns el que seria la federació, és un nivell molt dèbil, políticament parlant, i a nivell de mobilització de recursos, i a nivell d'administració, és a dir, la Unió Europea té una administració quantitativament petita, com dèiem, un pressupost petit, i políticament depèn molt d'algun altre nivell de govern, sobretot al nivell estatal, dels estats membres. Per tant, el problema no és si Europa és federal o no, el problema és quant de federal és Europa. I per mi Europa avui en dia és insuficientment federal perquè ja existeix un nivell federal però és petit. I a més a més depèn molt dels estats, que és el el nivell polític en aquesta federació que encara reté bona part del poder polític. I l'altre constrenyiment per mi, que l'ha anomenat també el professor Fanparis en la seva intervenció, és la manca de demos, de demos europeu en aquesta federació, en aquesta pseudo-federació. I això fa difícil compartir coses i fa difícil convèncer la part important d'aquesta federació, que són els estats membres, que cedeixin més sobirania. Perquè hi hagi una política social en el nivell federal, jo crec que això requereix moltes coses, però una d'elles és imprescindible, és el sentiment de solidaritat entre els membres d'aquesta federació. I és evident que això avui en dia no ho tenim. No ho tenim perquè hi ha una diversitat molt acusada dintre d'aquesta federació, però també no ho tenim perquè no hi ha la voluntat política perquè hi sigui. I per tant, per mi aquests elements dibuixen una pseudo-federació que políticament és dèbil i que pel que fa al desenvolupament de polítiques socials té moltes pedres en el camí, no? I seguint potser amb aquesta pregunta o amb la idea que heu mencionat els dos d'èxit econòmic però fracàs polític, es podria dir que és potser l'èxit econòmic que ha portat al fracàs polític, en el sentit que arribat a un cert punt es va donar molt de poder econòmic a la Unió Europea, amb el single market a partir dels 2000, llavors va ser quan va començar a haver-hi una desafecció creixent a Europa per part dels ciutadans. Es parla de vegades a la literatura del sedated giant i del need to politicize Europe. Llavors, no sé què en penseu d'això. No, a veure, jo soc pessimista a curt termini, però optimista a llarg termini, perquè també la Unió Americana va tenir altíssimes tensions i la Guerra Civil dels Estats Units del segle XIX 
també va estar motivada pels rescats federals, no només pel tema de l'esclavitud, sinó també quan Washington ha de rescatar Virgínia, si us us pren pagaments, s'ha d'emetre deute públic a nivell de tota la federació. Vull dir, la Unió Americana va ser molt llarga, molt costosa i dolorosa també, no? Jo penso que la integració econòmica és una idea de Hayek reeixida. Jo, per exemple, ho diria, imagineu-vos en 30 segons la crisi del 2008 amb la pesseta. Inflació del 20% anual, tipus d'interès del 20% anual, devolucions de la pesseta del 40% anual, Bankia hauria contaminat el sistema financer, espanyol per complet, corralitos bancaris, ruïna de les classes populars, retallades brutals i ruïna de les inversions empresarials i multinacionals. Això hi ha bastant de consens en economistes espanyols de diferent color, veuen això, en canvi l'or ens ha donat estabilitat, predictabilitat, inflació controlada, tipus d'interessos baixos, bancs centrals independents i competents, moneda estable i forta, que és capaç d'absorbir que el petroli pugi un 30% en un trimestre, en termes d'inflació interior, per tant ha sigut un èxit. I el single market anirà creant aquest demos europeu. I per tant, jo, bueno, si més no li dono un escenari de probabilitat gran, jo veig els meus fills amb la moneda única a la butxaca, pensant on faran l'Erasmus, que a Europa ja és el seu mercat d'oportunitats, que prefereixen que el Barça guanyi la Champions que la Lliga o la Copa del Rei, és així, i que ells estan disposats a lluitar més per la moneda única, però hem d'esperar que la integració econòmica i comercial i els intercanvis humans facilitin la creació d'un demos europeu. I per tant, no és mala estratègia, integrem-nos primer econòmicament, perquè després vindrà la necessitat de, per exemple, un subsidi d'atur europeu, que estem defensant ara alguns a la comissió, a la discussió de l'Stability Function, i que l'entenem com plantar una llavor. El Philip Lamberts, el coordinador dels Verds, ja li hem fet renunciar, ell volia impacte macroeconòmic d'aquest fons, i dic, mira, Philip, no serà això. Més val plantar una llavor ara, obrir la porta, posar aquesta llavor, no en forma de subsidi, sinó de crèdits concedits a un país per complementar el subsidi de tur nacional, i que la gent vegi que Europa també pot servir per crear aquests llaços de solidaritat si hi ha un xoc asimètric en un país per una crisi financera que en un altre país no hi és. Però més que... I acabo amb això. No imaginem la Unió Europea avui en dia com una gran transfer union, sinó com una best practices union, on cada país aporta les lleis que millor funcionen i que els altres copien i imiten per millorar en el seu conjunt. A veure, és cert i fins i tot en algun àmbit és indubtable que econòmicament la integració europea ha comportat beneficis, però en altres àmbits crec que tenim algun element per posar aquesta afirmació amb algun interrogant. Per exemple, aquesta setmana han sortit les dades del PIB regional a la Unió Europea. Jo crec que un indicador d'èxit de la integració europea hauria de ser com de diferents som avui en relació amb fa 40 anys, o fa 30 o fa 20. Resulta que la regió més rica de la Unió Europea és la cita de Londres, que em sembla que està al 635 o 640% de la mitjana del PIB de la Unió Europea i la més pobra està al 32% que està a Bulgària. Evidentment, si voleu, traiem allò de la City de Londres perquè allà on hi ha els bancs i el poder financer, traiem això. Doncs la primera és Luxemburg, que està al 175-180, i l'última continua sent una regió vulgària amb el 32%. Per tant, si avaluem l'èxit econòmic amb la convergència, jo crec que aquí no hem aconseguit tants èxits, no? Continuem tenint una unió monetària, un mercat únic, però sense un tresor europeu i amb competència fiscal entre els estats membres i entre els membres de la zona euro. Per tant, això també genera disfuncions. Per tant... Èxits econòmics sí, però en alguns àmbits em sembla que estem encara amb unes mancances importants. Tenim el 22% de la població europea, de la població de la Unió Europea, 
que està en risc d'exclusió social, 22%. Això gairebé són 100 milions de persones. Jo crec que això també hauria de frenar una mica el discurs d'eufòria, d'èxit de la integració europea. Per tant, des d'un punt de vista econòmic, crec que hauríem d'exigir encara millors resultats. Des d'un punt de vista polític, jo sincerament, i després de dos anys que porto només, però porto en una institució europea, al Parlament dos anys, no veig per enlloc en aquests moments voluntat política de reforçar aquest component federal de la Unió Europea, al contrari. És a dir, és que aquest debat que estem tenint aquí sobre l'Europa Federal, el Parlament Europeu, aquesta idea, vaja, és que està a anys llum del mainstream dels debats que tenim al Parlament Europeu. És a dir, el mainstream és... Anem fent amb el que tenim, que ja en tenim prou, i esperem a veure què passa amb el proper Parlament Europeu perquè la composició em temo que serà menys europeista, per tant, menys integracionista i més escurat a la dreta. I ja veurem què farem amb aquesta Europa, no? És a dir, el discurs és, tenim els tractats que tenim, intentem treure suc d'aquests tractats, però mantenim la unanimitat en decisions, en àmbits importants de decisió en el Consell, per tant, mantenim la paràlisi en temes importants que no hi ha manera de desencallar, com la reforma del sistema d'asil de Dublín, o com la taxa de transaccions financeres, que fa molts anys que se'n parla, i després va dir, bueno, com que això requereix unanimitat, intentem a través de la via de la cooperació reforçada. Resulta que ni una ni l'altra, no? O la directiva de tracte d'antidiscriminació i tracte igualitari, que fa deu anys que està a la taula del Consell, no? Per tant... Jo, políticament, soc bastant... Intento ser sempre optimista, però en aquest cas, diguem-ne, també soc realista i no veig una voluntat d'avançar cap a una Europa més política i encara menys més social. Bueno, fes una propera pregunta. Sí, o si vols entretenir aquí, vols entretenir. Sí, si puc reaccionar some of the points that have uh, been made. Um, one, um, well, is it uh, really Hayek in, uh, Hayek in Europe, the sort of uh, thing he was hoping to have, given how much regulation there is, including by the European Union itself? Because part of the regulation is the regulation that is needed in order to deepen the market. And so part of it is antitrust uh, policy, for example, in order to strengthen the competition. All the things about common uh, norms uh, is also a way of uh, suppressing a non number of non-tariff uh, obstacles to free competition. So the fact that there is a strongly regulator regulatory aspect of the European Union is not a proof that is not uh, neoliberal because some of these uh, regulations can make it neoliberal. But then on the more uh, fundamental point is, uh, in w is the European Union an economic success and if so, in uh, uh, what sense and is it uh, then a political uh, failure? Uh, I, my own judgment in the light of uh, all I've read is that uh, there is, uh, uh, I believe it's an economic uh, success in the sense that uh, GDP per capita uh, in uh, the, for the population of the current European Union is higher than it would have been in the absence of a European Union. Now, this is a tricky uh, claim to make. It's a causal claim which assumes some sort of counterfactual about what the situation would have been in the absence of uh, the European Economic Community and, and what gradually became the European Union with the various enlargements. So it's a pre pretty heroic claim to make, but I'm willing to make it and most people uh, are making this sort of claim. But, of course, economic success doesn't reduce uh, to that. Uh, there are uh, two uh, dimensions that have been mentioned. One is that economic success also means to uh, uh, create the conditions for sufficient stability. And uh, with uh, the introduction of the common currency, in under conditions uh, that were not uh, optimal for 
uh, the sort of uh, uh, currency area we were creating, of course, this was the seed for uh, uh, a number of uh, turbulences which actually happened, including those that enabled then some member states that were more competitive at a certain point, given that the others couldn't use competitive devaluation in order to resist this increase in, in competi competitiveness, for example, uh, created by the big reform of the German welfare state in 2005. And so uh, that meant, of course, if you make your country more competitive and you are in a single market, especially a single currency, it amounts to making other countries less competitive. And given that there is no buffering mechanism of the sort that exists in the dollar uh, currency area, in uh, where the states have also diverged massively, but there have been the buffering mechanism far more powerful in Europe, both through immigration, uh, migration between the states, and of course through a welfare state that's organized at the federal level, even though it's weaker than our um, national welfare states, it's much stronger than any redistribution that happens at the level of the Union. So economic success on average, yes, but uh, at the same time not so much because of the instability it creates, especially by virtue of the existence of uh, the common currency, but not only for that reason. And also uh, a, a rise in, in the average, but also uh, a tendency to divergence rather than uh, convergence, uh, certainly in terms of uh, primary incomes, also because of a massively new phenomenon all over the world, which is uh, uh, the, the growth in the importance of economies of agglomeration. And so you have, uh, just as you have some parts of Germany that are really losing uh, their population, depopulating, I mean, very striking in some places, to the benefit of a few centers, if you have a single market, you have whole countries that are depopulating, like Hungary or Bulgaria, especially with their human capital that is fleeing, and there is no way in which these that can hope to have convergence. I mean, you can do some structural funds, build a few bridges, uh, uh, fast speed trains or whatever. This is not going to make the difference because you have a, a dynamics of uh, 21st century capitalism that c will concentrate more and more of the wealth in London, in Paris, uh, in uh, Barcelona, in, in, uh, in a number of places, at the expense, no doubt, uh, of the others. But then the crucial point, and I finish uh, <laughs> with this set of comments. Uh, so, economic success, yes, in some sense. Uh, I mean, we, we shouldn't uh, spit on it. It's, a, it's an important thing, but with these two qualifications. But then political failure, why fundamentally? Why fundamentally? Yes, your children and my children and Erasmus and, and their move and roaming and all that, this is a fantastic thing for a fantastically small portion of the European population. That is, you have uh, uh, people like the people in the room, the people here, who are the movers. I, I, once, I, the first time this was formulated to me was by the current president of the European Court of Justice, uh, Kuhn Lehnert. He said at a seminar we had in Leuven that uh, uh, he said, well, you know, the, the European Union will only regain its legitimacy when it will do and be perceived to be doing uh, important things, not only for the movers, but only for the uh, also for the stay-at-homes. And the stay-at-homes, the people who travel occasionally, but in fact don't care very much about that aspect, they are the big majority of the European population. And for them, what is the European Union? European Union is that institution that imposes all these rules that end up uh, driving into bankruptcy uh, the factory where your uncle was working. It is uh, the, the that, uh, bureaucratic institutions that say you can no longer have borders that prevent people <coughs> from coming in, and therefore uh, my uh, little town where I went shopping is full of Bulgarians with whom I cannot communicate. And my world, both economically and culturally in terms of what, is threatened by this bureaucratic monster that is lifting one after the other all the things that my uh, national state will, was there to protect me, put there to protect me. And so the, the political failure, including part of the Brexit vote, but also part of the, 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 the Gilets jaunes and, the, and, and the, the Le Pen vote and the Orban vote and, and the Salvini vote, uh, part of that is the lack of a caring Europe. It's just a discipline in Europe that is there to say 3%, please, no more, 
uh, even if it, uh, you want to use a bit more in order to, to, to help the poor in your, con in your, your country or to help make important investment uh, for the future given climate change and so on. It's there to discipline, we need some sort of discipline, but not only that. And so that the political failure, in my view, is then related precisely by the lack of uh, a social Europe. Is it difficult? Is it uh, excluded by, uh, by, by the current mood? Please read Hayek again, not the road of, to serfdom, which has a second chapter that says the great utopia, where he says, uh, forget about utopia. No, r read what he said five years after the road to freedom. I repeat, those who have concerned themselves, and this applies to people from all parties, those who have concerned themselves exclusively with what seemed practicable in the existing state of opinion I've constantly found that even this has rapidly, rapidly become politically impossible as a result of changes in a public opinion which they have done nothing to guide. That's the, your job. It's not to say, oh, this uh, federal Europe, this is not done because the public opinion is not for my colleagues in the European Parliament think it, it's no good. No, we have to, to think it's not good in itself, a federal union. We don't need a, a federal state. Huh? What is a state? A state is defined by some powers that include the monopoly of the use of force, huh? being the boss of the military and of the police. We don't want the European Union to be that. Huh? We need more common defense, but certainly not the head of the police, right? Uh, it is the control of a compulsory redistribution. We don't want the whole of redistribution to be operating at the European Union. We need some of it. And it is the control over education, uh, compulsory education. That is really the key, uh, the, the key uh, powers. Of course, we are far more than a confederation, especially in the Eurozone. Uh, but we need more powers in order precisely not to keep being a political failure. And so we, it's not that being federal is good in itself. It's because there are a number of things which it can no longer do at the effic eff efficiently at the, at the national level, precisely because we have this uh, single market. But we shouldn't be... Uh, uh, Hayek, is, uh, he said lots of other interesting things, but he said this one, which we must, have, instead of praying every morning, read this. Dos minuts. Hayek, a camí de servitud, diu que el mercat no pot desplegar la seva capacitat de creació de riquesa si no hi ha un poder públic prou fort per fer complir els contractes, per garantir la seguretat i que eduqui, alimenti i vigili la salut de les persones del seu país. I això dona un ampli camp per córrer el sector públic eficient. Per tant, no és un autor contra el que podríem pensar que vol eliminar absolutament tot el servei. Al contrari, sense aquests mínims de poder públic eficient no hi ha mercat que pugui crear riquesa. Això per parlar de Hayek. Després, nosaltres sí que tenim una alternativa de mirar com era l'economia catalana abans de l'euro. Jo he estat al Banc Central Europeu com a coordinador d'economia i l'últim dinar que vam tenir amb el Governing Council fins i tot es va fer broma d'un procés d'independència amb màxims històrics amb tots els indicadors econòmics. Records de tràfics, exportacions, tràfic aeri, port de Barcelona, aeroport de Barcelona, inversió multinacional, pymes, creació de llocs de treball... I era fantàstic, perquè amb la pesseta jo he vist fa 25 anys un ministre d'Economia espanyol pujar el tipus d'interès al 15%. I les hipoteques anaven al 18 i al 20%. I quan va venir a Barcelona, que Catalunya és un país de pymes exportadores, greument afectades per un tipus d'interès com aquest, que fa impossible demanar crèdits industrials i que altera el valor de la divisa moltíssim, la resposta de Carlos Solchaga, ministre d'Economia, va ser un tuit que deia «Espanya és un país de multinacionales i camareros del tipo de interès, no és una variable relevante». Fantàstic. Això és l'autarquia espanyola que hem tingut amb unes inflacions del 5 al 10% anual, amb uns tipus d'interès discrecionalment incrementats pel ministre de Torn, i ara tenim 20 anys de model nòrdic que ha fet funcionar la capacitat de creació de riquesa que té Catalunya. Fins al punt que un procés d'independència, que és un estrès test per l'economia, el Banc Central Europeu diuen 
Qué peculiars que son los catalanes, porque están en máximos históricos de todo, en ple push de l'1 d'octubre y posterior. Y no? amb el Estado español fue una guerra económica para traer los bancos de Cataluña, donar la imatge y de provocar una recesión para poder decir independence es igual a recession. Y resulta que es todo el contrario. No? Per tant, i, i, i acabo amb el Jordi, si vol, ell, la competencia fiscal. Estados Unidos porta 150 años de, un, de política monetaria única, pero política fiscal ampliamente descentralizada. Y eso es muy importante, porque Florida es turística, eh, Oklahoma es agrari, Illinois es industrial. Cuando tú pujas o bajas el tipo de interés a Estados Unidos, eso provoca un impacto desigual, según si el teu estat es agrari, es turístico o es industrial. Llavors, para evitar impactos diferentes, diferenciales de una política monetaria única, los estados tienen los impostos para poder fer front en aquests xocs asimètrics de una política monetaria única. Hi ha moltíssima literatura econòmica sobre el tema i també està demostrat que no hi ha race to the bottom quan hi ha competència fiscal. És a dir, totes les empreses del Dow Jones estan a Delaware. Delaware és el que cobra l'impost de societats més alt dels Estats Units. I podrien estar a Florida, que és on és el tipus d'interès més baix de societats. Per què ho fan? Per altres elements. Per exemple, a Delaware té els millors tribunals para hacer frente a las OPAs. En tres semanas hay una sentencia que autoriza o desautoriza una OPA cuando una empresa vol comprar una otra. Por tanto, cuando no hay competencia fiscal, no hay registro de bottom. Y acabo, yo soy de la opinión de Wolfgang Munchau, que escribe al Financial Times cada día lunes, él ha dicho Irlanda no té com como único instrumento de competitividad el impuesto de sociedades. Si Francia imposa la armonización de tipos, Irlanda surtirá de la Unión Europea abans que se dir el único element de creación de riqueza. Y si parlem amb eurodiputats irlandesos, fins i tot el que dormen al nuestro hotel, el Pablo Iglesias irlandés, aquel que va amb la cua, el Cunningham, aquel, yo le he visto a la Cuja de Economía defensar el derecho de Irlanda a fixar un tipo de societats del 5 y del 10%. Fins i tot los comunistas irlandesos están para eso. Just for your information. Thanks. Um, I think we'll open the, the debate. We'll open the floor. Yeah, it's, is that okay? So we have 10 minutes, around 10, 15 minutes, and we'll finish at 8. Um, preguntes per, pels ponents, pels tres ponents. Yeah, I think there's a microphone. Yeah, microphone. Oh, yeah. Si us presenteu i, i feu la pregunta. Ok, so, uh, my name is Pascal and I'm the representative of uh, En Marche, the political movement of Macron, here in Barcelona. Um, first, I just wanted to say that uh, I was extremely uh, disappointed when uh, the parliament uh, rejected the transnational list uh, last year as well, and I'm uh, really excited of uh, some initiative like uh, Volt uh, as well here. Uh, even if I don't know about uh, what's going on with that because of uh, the actual institution system. But my question is not about that. My question is about uh, future, uh, because we've been talking a lot about uh, nowadays, uh, what's happening nowadays in Utah. But about future, uh, like we all know that uh, humans have two skills, like uh, physical and cognitive skills, uh, mostly. And uh, the area of uh, the revolution uh, industrial, revolution industrial, uh, before uh, took uh, the job for physical uh, things, and now we have the cognitive uh, skill uh, left, uh, which is going to be taken over uh, by artificial intelligence. So uh, my question is, or I want to know your thoughts about. Uh, what's going to happen with the labor market and is it possible uh, to think about uh, a basic income and what kind of basic income? Like, Should it be only uh, money or um, healthcare, education? Well, just want to know what you think. Yeah, yeah maybe that's better actually. So, And if you want to say also if the question is for a specific um, expert. Més preguntes? Va. Mira, ja. 
Hello. Oh, my name is Clemens. I'm a uh, PhD student at UPF here in Barcelona. Um, I would like to make, it's, it's really rather a comment than a question, on the political failure of the European Union. And I think that this, there has been a pattern of promoting European integration, which I think is very hurtful for the popular support. And that is this idea that you have these like the political scientists, like you call it, spillover effects. So you start, you make one step of integration, and then you have like a further necessities arise for further integration. And I think there is maybe a perception among people that this logic has been used like to almost trick people into integration, even though they didn't want it, or they, they feel that there's no public debate, it's just, it all follows the, a logic of necessity. So for example then, when the euro was created, most people were pretty clear about the fact that a political union is needed to complement the uh, economic and monetary union. Right? There was, most economists said that well, even the politicians were quite re reasonably clear that this would be necessary. And they right, thought, well, okay, there's no political support at this point for a political union, so we're just going to have this economic and monetary union. So in time, people are going to realize more or less, okay, this doesn't work without the political union, so we're going to have the political union afterwards. And this, to me, this is, is kind of a way of almost tricking people into more integration. And I think that's why people have become suspicious. Another, another example is really of this, this, this type of thing going on is like the, the referendums in the Netherlands and France, right, where the constitution was rejected. And we ended up having Lisbon Treaty. And the Lisbon Treaty is mostly... I mean, it's, it's got, it's very, it's, it's quite similar to the constitution. It's not called the constitution, but it's, so it, it sent a bit of a message that, okay, you can, you can reject like particular policies, but in the end, we're going to do it anyway because there's this, there is this discourse of necessity. And I think in, in some ways we have to be much more European politicians or like we, in general, in our public discourse, we have to be much more transparent and be much more genuine when we propose certain, it's, it's, in particular economic measures, like wh where this is going to end up. So exactly have this utopia and these utopian ideas and like defend them proactively and not just say, okay, we don't have, because I think it's partly because I'm, there I'm was- sorry. I, yeah. I think we've got- Yeah, I'm point. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, another question maybe, yeah, here. Yeah. And if they can be short. I will try to be short. So my question is for Professor Van Paris, but if everyone wants to answer, I, it's fine. I was a bit surprised that there was this very hard Brexit approach. You know, like Brexit, we have to treat, the, we don't have to treat them gently. Yeah? So, and my opinion is that I think if any social Europe, it's, uh, it's possible, it's a kind of a very asymmetrical European Union. And in a way, what, what Britain was asking before Brexit was, can you please limit uh, Schengen for me? I don't like this kind of Schengen, can you please limit it? The European Union said, no, I cannot limit that. That's one of my four liberties. So, and then the reaction is then, then I want secession, but I want a mild secession. Just, uh, just my point is, if we don't allow this kind of asymmetrical confederation, I think we are risking to have a lot of exits in the, in the future. So I really think asymmetric federalism or confederalism is a good option, but I think it's also a very pragmatic option for what is coming. Thank you. So there's three questions now if you want to answer. Yes. First question, uh, big question. So I, uh, with a colleague, we published a book on uh, basic income uh, with subtitle Radical Proposal for a Free Society and a Sane Economy. It was published by Harvard University Press uh, 2017. It exists also in Spanish and it will exist in French uh, uh, in April, published uh, by La Découverte, where uh, your question and many other questions about basic income are answered, but uh, I'm, uh, nevertheless, I, I'll say something about it. I don't believe, and 
with my colleague, we don't defend basic income on that ground in a sort of absolute rarefaction of jobs, and the robots are coming and are taking our jobs. I do believe that the technical change we are experiencing and we keep experiencing is relevant to uh, the plea for a basic income. Uh, but uh, very briefly, it can be formulated as follows. You have uh, labor-saving technical change, but of course, including the labor that is being saved, as you mentioned, is also intellectual labor, not only manual labor as in the past, increasingly. And uh, so that is coming, will keep happening, and it is combined with globalization, that is competition for uh, the products that are produced with low-skilled uh, labor with the whole world. This has as a result not necessarily a rarefaction of jobs, but certainly a polarization of earning power, which means that some people who own capital, who own intellectual property rights, and who own human capital that is particularly valuable at a, at a particular time, uh, from football players to uh, software developers, these people see their earning power, so go to the sky, and at the same time, uh, many people see their earning power shrink uh, below the poverty level, or even if they are working full time, they may be below the poverty and the, the working poor. It depends a bit on the, it depends to a significant extent from the particular way in which the bottom of the labor market is organized in various countries, with or without uh, subsidies, etc., etc. But essentially, that is happening. And so in the case for a basic income consists in saying what we need is really to have a, a floor that is unconditional and that makes it easier for everyone to, um, to have life learn, lifelong learning. So it encourages, system, it facilitates uh, working part-time when uh, it's in order to retrain, when it's still time to avoid the burnout, to look after your children when your children need it. And, and, uh, and basic income, instead of uh, getting people trapped at the bottom, like what we have with the means-tested systems, it really helps as a floor and as a sort of permanent way of uh, making the, both society more fair, but also the economy more dynamic. So that's very briefly, that's the connection between basic income and, and, uh, and the issue you rightly raised. Then, uh, yes, um, so-called neo-functionalism, as it's called, uh, so that was uh, development of uh, an idea that was first formulated even before the coal and steel community existed by Jean Monnet, which uh, said, I, you, what, uh, what you are going to uh, see, he said, is uh, uh, we are going to create a solidarité de fait, uh, and solidarité de fait means really an interdependence, uh, which will then call for further measures. That was uh, for further reforms and the strengthening of the European institution. So we, you, and typical example is indeed the, 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 the common currency where in fact, because of uh, the increasing trade, you say, well, it would be easy to have a common currency so that you, you don't have all these uh, frictional problems, etc. It will make trade more fluid, so you create it. And once you create it, of course, you, you increase massively your mutual dependency. And as a result of that, you say, now we need a fiscal union and we need a social union or something like that. And so that you say, are people being tricked? I, I don't think there is a big plot anywhere on the part of anyone. There are people who see the benefit of doing a further reform and don't fully, most of them don't, don't anticipate what it is going to lead to. Is it nevertheless uh, uh, an important uh, something that is good, all things considered. I think this pressure towards further integration while respecting uh, the subsidiarity principle that is decentralizing also some policies to the local level more than we do now is something important. We need, there are many issues, starting with the massive issue of climate change, which we cannot possibly hope to solve at the global level if we don't act at least at the European level. So, and to do that, because also any measure we take in that respect has a social dimension, it has distributive effects on people. So you need to join uh, anything you do on the ecological side with social measures, and that must be done 
at a higher level. So I, be I believe that we need stronger political uh, integration, that it is con continuing for the reason I just mentioned, but also, of course, because of something, because of a problem that is solved, uh, that we think is solved and therefore is become invisible. Huh? We should never forget this situation in which this totally utopian project to recruit this was something that killed far more people than the American Civil War, our European Civil War that became a world war in the 1940s. And so now I'm struck, I think about it, uh, whenever a helicopter flies above my head, I, I live 500 meters from the place where the, all the heads of government meet in Brussels, now seven times per year. So this is, I, they never did so until 1975, so 20 years after the beginning of the, the institutions, and then they, they did so twice a year, and so now more than seven times a year, each head of government, despite all the things they have to do at home, they are there together to talk to each other. And so think compared that to the situation you had in the 1930s or so, uh, and where these people never talk to each other, where now they, they, they meet, uh, they meet, they have to justify themselves and what they do to each other. And there is no stronger power of civilization than talking together and having institutions that force you to justify yourself. And so this, I think, is extremely important for us Europeans, but also because of the example it gives for the institutions we need on a global level and in other parts of the world. So that I don't think there is a plot in this, uh, in, in this sort of a, I don't think, therefore, there is anyone tricking anyone else, but, uh, but there is a process that largely escapes and, and, uh, and which has uh, uh, consequences that are not anticipated. Brexit and my very unkind way of, um, <laughs> of handling it. I mean, I have a very special relationship to, to Brexit because I, I, I crossed the channel when I was uh, 23 as an intellectual refugee because uh, I was uh, uh, completely frustrated by the way philosophy was done on the continent. And I discovered uh, analytical philosophy and a sort of philosophy that I, I did my my uh, doctorate in Oxford, and far more important, I met my wife in Oxford, and my wife is British. So, uh, and my children, therefore, have dual nationality. And, uh, and so, on the night of the Brexit vote, I felt that, that uh, but I followed it through the night while my wife was sleeping, uh, but at six, uh, I thought when <laughs> it had turned the other way, I thought it was time to, to, to wake her up and uh, to say, so I said, you are out, and, and she, first, she first said, you wake me up for that. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, later in the day, she, for the first time in her life, she was grateful that she had uh, acquired Belgian nationality by virtue of marrying me. She had never seen the point until then. And, uh, <laughs> any, anyway, so I have a pretty personal relationship to, to that. And, and I do think, I think it's, uh, it's very bad to, to have had the Brexit because from now on with the Brits, uh, whereas before we could say us Europeans with them and we are trying to find solutions, we don't always agree, but we, we see these, these things and there are things we need to do for the worst off in the UK, like for the worst off. And now certainly we are in this situation where there is them and us. And, and of course, with diverging interests, then when you have people a la Boris Johnson or Dominic uh, Raab, who I mentioned, and so global Britain, and so we are going to, to, to try and you know, open to talent from all the European Union and all over the world. Of course, the uh, UK has tremendous uh, assets because of English, because, one, uh, yeah, because that's why so there are all these trans migrants who want to go there. That's why they can attract their universities, can attract uh, uh, so, so many good people from here. Fortunately, some of them return here so the, to, to, to the EU and reduce a little bit the massive uh, brain drain. So that, um, but, um, and London is a massive, um, because of these externalities these, uh, of agglomeration, uh, it's a tremendous combination of English and London use a tremendous magnet for, for brain drain. One of my sons uh, lives there. Has, as a huge salary, uh, several times what I ever heard in my in my life, but they they can do it because it's not. Any, and but then and we need and it's at the same time it's a real danger what I described earlier precisely because of these specific assets it had. 
And so that uh, should we have done something else, including being le less dogmatic on uh, the four <laughs> freedoms? I think so. I think there is nothing uh, sacrosanct about the four freedoms, as if uh, it's not like the Ten Commandments uh, that God gave directly. So you you can, and in particular because of the of the pressure on the redistributive systems that comes from the migration of uh, less uh, qualified people, especially to a country not only which where the linguistic obstacle is less than if you want to go to Hungary or to Finland, but also where you have a welfare state organized in such a way that you have more in-work benefits to people who come and work there, where it made their welfare system, they exaggerated in the argument, but uh, more vulnerable than uh, other welfare systems to the free movement of people. And so I think it's not incompatible with uh, the European dynamic to uh, mollify some of these, uh, of these constraints. Indeed, we don't have full free movement of people because it's only the workers, strictly speaking, and, and the job seekers who can move, and some of them with big uh, impediments. So that I don't think we, I'm, 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 we shouldn't be dogmatic. And so I'm not a purist, and I'm a pessimist like you in the short term, because uh, and I recommend that to everyone to be pessimist in the short term and uh, while remaining optimistic in, in the long term. Because if you are op optimistic in the short term, you keep having disappointments. If you are pessimistic in the short term, you keep having good surprises. Thank you. Um, unless there is a super pressing need to reply from Ramon and, and, and Jordi, maybe we'll leave it here and you can talk to them after. Oh, yeah, there's a pressing need. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, well, I, 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 don't need the, I, I don't know if it's a very pressing need, but uh, I just feel like uh, I want to say something maybe as a way of a final word. Um, I know that we politicians are not, are not here to manage the reality. We are here to try to change the reality according to our uh, ideals. I consider myself as being an European federalist. I belong to the most uh, federalist group in the European <laughs> Parliament, which is the Greens uh, European Free Alliance. And believe me if I tell you that being a uh, European federalist in Catalonia is something that uh, it's getting uh, more difficult uh, every day because of, uh, well, the way uh, the European Union has reacted or hasn't reacted to uh, our uh, democratic demands and, and claims. I believe in a stronger top level of this federation in the making, which is the, the European Union, and I, I believe that this top level should have more re, uh, redistributive um, competencies and effects in, 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 its policy, in its policies. But what I was trying to say is that after having been two years in the European Parliament and having seen, having seen what are the majorities there and what are the debates there and what are the failures there, uh, I have to say that I keep being an European federalist and for, for, from this point of view I, I, I consider uh, myself as also being an, uh, an utopian, but Europe or the European Union is not debating about what we have been debating this afternoon. And regretfully, we are debating about uh, other things. We are debating about if the next budget shall be 1.08% uh, of GDP instead of 1.00. <laughs> and, and this is the, the debate that we are currently having in the European Union. And I regret that, but I won't give up my, my federalist uh, ideals. He's too young. <laughs> wow, well, not that much. Not too old. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Do you, yeah. Just to uh, uh, say something about the um, cherry picking Europe. I think that the Brexit is a risk because uh, it has broken the demographic equilibrium between North and South. So now there is a temptation between Rome, Paris and Madrid. They have absolute majority in the Council and in the Parliament without uh, Great Britain. So it's, it will be much more difficult for a Dutch, for a Danish, for a Swedish MEP to win a vote in the Parliament and in the Council. So if the South imposes its vision on trade, on regulation, on bureaucracy, on different standards, maybe we will see 
future actually. I, and I hear MEPs from the liberal group, not from uh, eurosceptic groups, of these countries saying so. If the Europe that we will go to have is uh, uh, the three big capitals, Paris, Rome, Madrid, Europe, it will be less interesting for us. So maybe a confederal Europe uh, taking uh, into account the different sensibilities that we have in Europe, maybe it could be a transitional solution until we get more integration and more demos. European demos. Perfect. So thank you, all of you. And, and I think we've got, it's been a fascinating conversation and, and lecture and debate. Thank you for the questions. Uh, we'll leave it here and don't forget to vote.